I'm Allison Watt. Today we're going to talk about uh, small work. So I don't know whether some of you have uh, taken on the 100 day challenge, um, but I decided this year what I would do is do just small work because, you know, life is busy. And uh, also I kind of like the idea of creating a body of small work that might have threads connecting some or all of the pieces and even eventually perhaps framing them up together and hanging them as a show of small work rather than the larger works that I usually do. And I mean, I do like to work on really large work too. Um, but I think small work is great for lots of different reasons. Yeah, first of all, I'll sometimes go to small work when I'm, I haven't been painting for a while and I just feel like it's hard to get back into it. And uh, I feel like, oh, I'll just start small. And it's kind of a place where you can play. And it's also, I, I think of these small works as almost like little laboratories where you can experiment with different things. For instance, um, different kinds of mark making that you haven't tried before, different kinds of tools, um, techniques, maybe explore a palette that you'd like to, to figure out. Um, yeah, so, you know, these are kind of small spaces that we can uh, take some chances and be playful in. So um, I'm going to switch my camera around. We're going to look at some of the small work I've been making, and I'll do a little bit of demoing too. Well, so this is, um, these are two of the small pieces that I've been uh, working on these and, and I've, I've actually um, chosen dimensions that I know are going to be good for um, a three and a half by five inch mat. So I, the dimension of the piece is actually three and three quarters by five and a quarter to just give it a little bit of extra space. So I'll just grab a mat. Here's the three and a half by five inch mat. So you can see that I've been kind of interested in trees. I'm going to get that down a little closer, that camera. Um, and if you can look at the surface, I've been experimenting with lots of different kinds of uh, materials in this kind of one subject material or subject um, one subject lots of different kinds of materials and techniques so I'm going to take you through some of these um, here's some other pieces that I've been making again in the tree the tree thoughts you know the three the tree subject matters this one actually has got some um, uh, kind of pearlescent interference color on it and when you can see it shining on there. So I was, you know, taking the opportunity to play inside this small area with materials that I hadn't used before. Love those interference colors. And so, you know, they're tiny and messy, but when you put a mat, a mat on them, they, they, I think that they can stand as works on their own, some of them more than others. Here's a couple more. So this this one, um, I put some mark making down, use some um, drawing gum to protect, to mask certain areas, and then pulled some um, ink over top of it. And this one, I used a bit of collage. So this one, I think, reads as landscape. I had actually some silver underneath it um, that mostly got color, color covered up but again you know it's an opportunity to play with maybe different techniques and different um, materials that then you might usually just sort of jump into a big painting with so I, I have a couple of other examples here of small works this was a little landscape um, that I'm framed up matted up uh, so it was complementary color palette, yellow, purple, with bits of collage, collage that I'd already uh, done some mark making on. And, um, and then I went in with opaque painting 
in places like here to sort of create a little bit more form. So I really, I, I love uh, small work. And here's, this is a fun one. This is a Friends um, paper quilt. So not only is it small in, in its entirety, and it's mounted on a wooden cradle, but the little pieces have been cut out of other works. And there's a couple of, um, looks like collage pieces, printed things here too, like here. Um, and so she's made, <laughs> she's even used smaller building blocks to make this small work. And she has a series of these. So they're kind of fun all together. So I have prepared some uh, small spaces that we can work inside of. Here's one. I thought I'd take you through that um, technique that I used to with with masking fluid and um, a, an ink glaze over top to see what we can um, how. And again, with this kind of tree um, visual language, and see what we can make of this. So underneath here, my first layer is antelope brown ink. I really do love ink uh, because it's so look how transparent and intense it is it has the beautiful transparency of watercolor if you pull it out with a little bit of water I've also done a little bit of mark making with some oil sticks so these are um, they're like like oil pastel oil sticks are more archival than oil pastel uh, sometimes I grab an oil pastel that's actually an oil pastel but these are sticks and, and then I put some glazing fluid on, and, and most of you know that I love drawing gum, so uh, I use it a lot just to introduce um, elements that are unpredictable and uh, just to, as a fun way to play and interact in different layers. So it's great because it's uh, a little bit um, blue, although it doesn't really show up on here. But it's also very fluid, so it's easy to brush it on and, you know, make interesting gestural marks with it. So I'm going to put a darker ink on top of this. Maybe, um, uh, just let me grab one from my other table. This one is called Marine Blue. So let's see what happens here. Just going to drop it on. And it will be very, very intense. So um, if I get a flat here, you'll see that it's almost, almost opaque. It's so intense. So what I usually do with these, you can water them down ahead of time, but I often just spray them like this. And I have a paper towel beside me where I can shed some of this. Wow, that's really intense. Sometimes once I get it on, I lift it too. So uh, it's expensive stuff, so probably a good idea to water it down first, actually, and then you're not, then you're only using as much as you as you need. And <laughs> this is my textured paper towel, um, which I've used this before in demos, and it gives these kind of textured marks, which are. Um, you know, you, you may like that or you may not. I don't mind them because they look a bit organic. So I'm going to just dry this really quickly and then we'll pick up the uh, drying gum and see what that looks like. Okay, so uh, this is the fun part. We get to pull up the drying gum and see what's underneath. And I like to do it just with my fingers, but you could use a little tool, these uh, crepe erasers. I think they're called rubber cement lifting erasers. Lynn, can you get that? I'm going to ask my assistant, Lynn, to just see if she can get a bit more light down on my work here. Because it's small work, it's a little harder for you to see some of the details, I guess, but I, I will lift it up to the camera from time to time. So you can, that's a bit better, Lynn. Yeah, it just needs to be focused down on my hands. 
So that's kind of fun. Um, and then usually what I would do afterwards, if you can see that, that's what the drawing gum does, is it protects the underpainting. And then I would maybe come in with, um, I don't know, maybe some collage. As I say, like these are spaces where we get to play. So um, really, you know, it, it gives us a chance to interact inside this small space in lots of ways. So for instance, in these ones, on uh, these ones, I put on some collage pieces. And in this one, I did a lot of mark making with, um, actually that was done with a bird feather, this kind of scratchy mark making. So I went in afterwards with black and did some mark making. But I think maybe I'll, I'll dig around and see if I've got some collage pieces that might be fun to put on this piece. Um, so I have lots of collage pieces that I create. A lot of them have been made with jelly prints, actually, and on tissue paper and deli paper. And they're beautiful for collaging because uh, when you tear them and put them down on the, on the watercolor paper or whatever it is you're working on, I mean, this could also be applied. These, these techniques could be applied to working on canvas or cradles, um, but paper is always so easy to work on, um, and we get to crop it too if, if you know, we're working on a bigger piece, it's easy to crop down. So I'm just looking at what might be nice to put on this, this piece. Maybe these blues and greens. Here's some more of those. So some of these I've created just by uh, using mark making tools and either ink or black um, paint to create interesting textural marks. Um, some of them have almost almost look like script. I use Chinese um, brushes. This one was made with some uh, a, a, a stencil. So it's much more kind of a, a more of an organized mark making. These were made with jelly prints and using masks. Uh, here's some more of that kind of gestural made with uh, Chinese brushes. This is a jelly print too. So um, yeah, I think what I'll do is so hard to choose. Actually, maybe we'll use the stencil here see what, what happens to it as we tear it and collage it on. One of the great things about working with tissue paper is it just it disappears when you collage it on. I mean, just the, the pattern or the paint that's on the tissue paper remains, but the, um, the tissue paper itself just kind of disappears because you I, I will attach it with uh, with a medium, I'll use gloss medium, and then it just kind of uh, disappears and you get the, the pattern kind of um, floating on the surface. I'll just cut these. Okay, so I'll just... Um, Here's a piece of parchment paper. I'm just going to put the glazing fluid on there. And so what you want to do when you're collaging is make sure you get a nice even layer underneath and a nice even layer of mat, of medium on top. So you don't get any air bubbles. So I'm, I'm using this kind of um, ver the vertical line visual language here because that's what the trees are. And I kind of like this um, patterning, even though it's a stencil and doesn't look like very much like what you'd see in a forest. It's kind of, it's fun. And uh, it kind of creates a sense of dappled light. And we're going to change it. I'll do another layer too. So... Yeah, and so as I've said before and in other demos, um, using collage 
really you can do several things with it. You can create some new interesting textures with your collage. And you can also, if, if one of your uh, goals is to simplify collage, in, you can introduce kind of blocks of collage, especially like I keep these painted sections for that sort of thing. So uh, for instance, um, if I tear this, I could get a very simple piece of dark value that I could say if I really wanted to simplify an area and put down like that. Uh, that's not what I'm going to do here, but because I want to do some more things to these uh, collage pieces. But, you know, sometimes it's difficult for us to lose the beautiful things we've created in our underpaintings. We've talked about this <laughs> in discussions on the Artwork Art Play Facebook page, and I've talked about it in some of my other demos. We create these very uh, beautiful active surfaces, and then it's really hard for us to um, create structure by painting out or simplifying areas, making some areas quiet, leaving some areas active. So sometimes collage can really help with that because it'll really like quiet an area down. So I'm just gonna dry this and uh, figure out what to do next, stand by. So what I like here are where the pattern sits over the light. So this is not something I planned, it's just something I've discovered. And um, you can see what I was talking about, how the tissue paper just kind of disappears. And you know, you, you can get um, tough tissue paper. I forget what it's called, wet resistant tissue paper or something like that. But I just use a fairly inexpensive dollar store tissue paper. Uh, it's not archival on its own, but it gets buried inside the layers of medium. And so it's fine. As long as the, the paint you're using on it is archival, it's an archival piece. So I really like how that shows up here. And it almost, even though it was a textured, um, it was a texture created by a print, it almost looks like bark. So I think what I would do next here is maybe get a uh, heavy body paint. Um, or just for, for quickness, I'll use a fluid. That should work. And this is an ultramarine blue. Now that's a pretty bright color. Um, I might, I like to, to tone down some of my colors with umber, actually, to tell you the truth. But I'm going to put this on pure um, because it will also interact with what's underneath here. So I can go in and maybe paint some of this, te the uh, collage elements out in places where I don't think it's as interesting as here where it's sitting over the, the, uh, the gold underneath, or it was, if you remember, antelope brown. So I'm interacting with what's there and choosing what I want to keep, what I want to paint out. So this you know, I might do a little bit more work on this, um, but it will become part of that tree series. And it was pretty quick to do, right? So it didn't, doesn't take up the other great thing about small work is it doesn't take up a lot of time or a lot of materials. So, so there's a possibility to just explore and see what works. So now I know that this printed stencil is really interesting when it's broken up and, you know, could actually describe bark on a tree. I'm just going to go in and do a little positive painting there. Well, painting out negative shapes. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'd eventually probably uh, add some lights to that, too. I'll just bring that up a little closer so you can see what's going on there. And so it's got its darkest darks. It's got some middle values. It really needs some light. So I'd continue working in there, maybe mix some uh, ochre and white. And uh, maybe I'll do that because this is actually a very important part of resolving 
paintings is making sure you get your full value range. So I'm going to mix up a little bit of yellow ochre and some white. I've got a fluid white here. And ochre, both ochre and fluid and white, titanium white, are very opaque. So uh, I'm just going to go in with a little round. Mix that up. A little bit of blue in my brush still, that's okay. And now I can maybe bring in some of those lighter values. Actually, I need a finer brush. So, I mean, when you do start working in these small spaces, you do find yourself working with small brushes. And, I mean, I like working with big brushes, so that's why I like using uh, collage, because you get some details and texture in without actually having to resort to these these small brushes, which a friend of mine calls migraine brushes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see how the uh, the painting did need a lighter value. I hope you can all see that and how the full range of values is what gives drama to our work. So I'm just kind of painting in and around some of those um, little textural kind of marks that the the uh, stencil created. So now I've got, you know, how many layers have I got working here? Probably uh, five or so. It's pretty easy in these small spaces to start building up a lot of layers, which is a good thing because, you know, acrylics are kind of flat by nature. They're, they don't have the luster of, of uh, oils. And so the more layers that we build up on them, the more interesting they become. And, you know, I'm going to leave this one here. I... I'll post it on Artwork Art Play when I finish it so you can see where I might take it. Um, that might even get glazed back again. So don't forget when you put a light on with, say, titanium white or a mix of titanium white and something else, you can still glaze it. You remember my last um, live was on glazing. You can glaze it and it's almost like tinting a photograph. The light, you don't lose your lights. My hands are somehow very black. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> um, uh, you don't lose your lights. You, they're still there. So that's one of the strengths of glazing. So um, other things we can do in these small spaces. We can experiment with um, mark making. So maybe you have some tools uh, or... I don't know. I have a lot of funky stuff for mark making, like this, these things, feathers, and rope brushes, oil basters from the kitchen. That's one of my favorites. Um, and I love to, here's a meat tenderizer. I love to do mark making. But, you know, I know what these all do, but perhaps. Um, you have some in your studio or you've collected them and you're not you're not really it feels like a big risk to go in and do that on a big piece of canvas or paper um, so try it in a small space let me get another palette here i'm going to put some dark this is carbon black going to thin it down a little bit with water and this is a crow feather just want to show you this is a great mark making tool I love so one of the, one of the things I love about using strange tools for mark making is uh, you can't really control them exactly and I like to work with twigs too Let's have a look at some other mark making. So here's the the meat tenderizer, two calibers, little spots, big spots, 
So um, if you've looked at my YouTube video on mark making, then uh, you'll know that th this is creating a visual language. So the marks that we make create a visual language. Uh, let's have a look at this one. I haven't used this one much. Let's try it down here. It's kind of fun. And in a bigger, on a bigger um, piece of paper or a canvas, these marks would be smaller. But in a small space, they have a little bit more power because they're, uh, they're bigger relative to the space they're in. So let's have a look at this one. I really love these because they're, they're really bendy and you can sort of push down on them and get different kinds of marks. So these uh, small pieces now, those that would be kind of an underpainting and I would, when it's dry, I'd go in and do something else on it. I, you know, in this, in this kind of vein, I could collage onto it, glaze it. So my sort of core techniques that I'm working with mostly within these small spaces um, in my 100 day challenge are um, laying down an underpainting, doing some mark making, using both paint and, and pastel. I love to use pastel and um, collaging and sometimes even re remasking and reglazing. So just keeping it kind of open and playful as long as possible. So um, let's look again at some of these so you, you can go through some of these phases, these stages with me. And actually, to tell you the truth, I can't remember what, what the different steps were, but if we highlight this one here, uh, I think I put a, I think I put a turquoise underpainting on and I did some um, mark making. I did some overdrawing with a white marker as well. I don't know if you can see those small details. I did do some collaging, although some of it is lost. As I say, you know, the, the, the tissue really it loses its edges. So it's really great because it just kind of merges into the whole piece. Then I did some glazing over top. So some of these greens here, for instance, are um, antelope brown pulled over this turquoise. And then I, I, then I took opaque white with a little bit of, of uh, ochre and painted in some spaces with opaque paint. So there's probably six or seven layers there. So even though it's a small space and it can happen really fast. Um, so it helps you to build these techniques and habits of creating richly layered paintings as well as simplifying uh, to create structure. So the other thing that we can do in these small spaces is maybe um, <laughs> something I really love creative destruction. Um, this is a, a piece, these are cutouts from a piece that I did as a demo on uh, contour drawing botanicals. And I've already put some, I've put some uh, masking fluid on here. And um, so somewhat like I did with the trees, I'm going to drop another color on top. This is orange, flame orange. Just trying to find just the right brush. Here we go. Just use a little bit less of it than that blue. It's not as powerful and opaque as the blue that I used on the trees. And spraying it just pulls it out into more of a transparent layer. So we don't have as much cover as with the blue. And I'll just give that a quick dry. And let's have a look at this, what, what we get. So that would be the first, 
step in interacting with this, I won't call it a failed um, painting, but sometimes I do do this with failed paintings and just put drawing gum on, put a glaze on, and it gives you a new way into the work. So you can experiment with this technique um, with this kind of, in this kind of small space. I can never resist throwing on some mark making. There's some oil pastel. Just interacting in layers. And, you know, I'd probably do several layers to keep going through that. So finally, I want to talk about um, another of the many, many things you can do in small spaces. Um, and that is maybe explore different palettes that you're not used to. And or visual language. So I drew these with an archival pen this morning. This is my favorite archival pen, my favorite Castell Pitt artist pen. And um, I was just exploring different, different language. I, I wanted to create these very simple um, compositions. So I was looking at pictures, photographs of castles and arches and, and just to kind of create a new language. So that's an example of something that you can explore in a small space. But I also wanted, I want today to explore a palette that I'm not used to. So one of the things, I mean, you can tell from my pieces, I always reach for brights, right? And, um, one thing that I'd like to do is work more with neutral palettes. So I'm going to mix a neutral palette, maybe with um, Payton's Gray. There is some black here, and blacks give us neutrals too. But we can get some really interesting neutrals from um, mixing together primaries or earth tones or you know complex tones like... Um, Paints gray, like the ochres and the siennas um, and the umbers. They can also give us really interesting neutrals. So how about Paints gray, yellow ochre? I've still got some white here. And let's see what kind of neutral we can get from that. Get myself a little flat to work with. So it turns gray right away. So we've got, it's a green gray because there's a lot, there's blue. We're really mixing a blue and a yellow. We're going to add a little white to it. Then it starts to get kind of interesting. And actually just these three things, titanium white, ochre, and Payne's gray, can uh, create a lot, a lot, a lot of beautiful colors, depending on how much of the different ingredients and white we put in it. So let's just work, you know, I might, exploring these, this language and this palette, start working in this painting here. And I'm, you know, I'm not looking to be very tidy right now because I'm just really exploring the palette. And the underlying, um, Visual language is just was part of my my play this morning, trying to figure out, you know, how to create a new visual language for myself because that's really an architectural language, and most of my visual language is more, um, I would say, uh, biomorphic, so from plants and landscape. So uh, I don't know whether I'll integrate this into my work or not. But I haven't taken a great big risk with this because I'm working inside a pretty small space. And I really love this palette, actually. Let's get it a little darker and see what happens. I also really, when you put opaques down, it's always nice to scratch into. Just use the bottom of my brush. Because why not? So that's a gorgeous kind of putty color. So that's Payne's Gray, Ochre, and White, just those 
those three. So that that's a palette that I don't use very much. Um, it's actually not a completely new palette for me, but it's nice to go back and remind myself how uh, how versatile this palette is, and it really really creates. Let's just add a little white to that darker blue. That's a new expression of the palette. It's almost it's really almost pure Payne's gray and and white, but I'm going to pull a little bit of the greeny gray into and see what that does here. Just because it's an, another expression. It's, so this creates a really harmonious palette. Uh, yeah, so um, that is uh, what I have to say about working small. Um, I, as I said earlier, I really do like to work small with landscape too. The pieces I've shown you mostly today are in this kind of tree language because that's kind of what, where I started this series of a of hundred. Well, hopefully it will be a hundred. Um, I've got some traveling ahead of me, so I'm actually going to just bring a bunch of uh, doubles like this, blanks, and either bind them together. You can, you know, you can bind your own sketchbooks for travel. Just take them to staples. You can cut your own paper, get them to put a ring binder in. And that's what I'll travel with so that I'll just have them there. I'll tape them down the middle and I'll have them uh, to, to work with as I travel. I won't be continuing to work with um, acrylics and inks though, because I'll be traveling light with my watercolors. I'll have some mark making tools, uh, pens, and my watercolors. So they'll look quite different from these. Um, we'll see. So uh, I hope that you I've, I've inspired you to um, jump into some small spaces. And you know, you know, people really love to get these as cards too. So Say you're just uh, you just work in a small space to get yourself warmed up for working on a on a larger piece. Um, don't throw these in a drawer. Get some card blanks and put them onto card blanks and send them off in the snail mail to friends. So uh, we'll see you on artwork art play and have fun with small work.